What do you think is your main task at this moment? And so what do I mean by that? Um, I was listening to someone on the train and he was telling his friend uh, how right he was about an issue. Essentially saying like, this is the way that it is and anyone that doesn't think that is X, Y, and Z. I don't know if they were racist, misogynist, something. The other side was completely demonized. So I might say to him that one of his tasks in terms of his own political consciousness is a certain self-righteousness. And how does that, or this need to be right, right? This need that like, I believe what I believe and anyone who doesn't believe that is not worthy of anything, right? Must have, must be incentivized by something negative, self-interested, right? So each of us have a task in our own political consciousness that we are responsible for as good citizens, right? So if you think about what it might be for you, maybe it's cynicism. Maybe it's looking at the other side and saying, there's nothing good about the other side. Anyone that doesn't believe what I believe must have bad intentions. Maybe it's hypocrisy. So maybe you're out there fighting for climate change and then you're behaving at home as if there's nothing wrong with the environment, right? So there's a certain amount of you know, uh, preaching and then there's a behavior internally or in your own individual self that doesn't align with what you're preaching about in your politics. Maybe you don't know your own privilege and so there's a way you might sort of hear a population that feels marginalized or ostracized and you deny that because you're not looking at your own privilege. Maybe you don't vote. Maybe you sort of don't participate in the process and, and then wonder why sort of things are what they are. So I really want to invite you before we start to just take a moment and think through like what is my individual task as a, as a citizen to sort of explore within myself which can then affect the system. And if anyone feels called to name what that is for themselves, just to call it out in the room, you know, feel free to do it. The reason why I'm inviting you to do this is as we explore these political systems, you might see versions of your own task in how the systems become distorted. So that's, that's why I want to invite you to do that. You were? I step away from it. You step away, so you don't participate? Well, no, I definitely vote. I okay. Do not vote it, so. And is it possible that you don't participate because you have a sense of like either, I don't want to say hopelessness, but is there a sense of like, I can't have an impact. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. There's no. There's no place for me. The arena. The arena. It doesn't. It, it, I can make no impact on the, in that arena. Okay. It doesn't mean that I don't go march and go just stand up. And, you know. But the real arena, what's going on? I don't think I have any power. Okay. So you don't feel your power. You don't feel your power. No. You don't see don't where you can have an effect. Exactly. Okay. Great. I was trying to think what mine is. I think I'm a hypocrite. I'm for sure a hypocrite, and I also don't, I think I'm just exploring my privilege. Um, and I think that, uh, there is a sense of self-righteousness. There is a sense of like, this is what I believe and it's based on all this sort of education and sort of integrity and there's a way I can be dismissive of the other, of an opposing view. So I think those might be some of mine. So think about it. And if you want to, if more come up and you want to name them, please do so. Okay. So why this lecture and why this lecture now? Most of the lecture, last, our last lecture was about sexual consciousness. <laughs> and now to me, this is far more exciting. <laughs> I don't know what that says about my sex life. But um, <laughs> um, you know, every, every lecture, as Alan said, is how is, our, how is our internal world a reflection of our external world and how is our external world reflecting our internal world? So political consciousness is no different than anything else we've talked about. These are just, a, it's a different set of systems we're looking at. But in those systems, because they were created by us, by humans, are our own struggles and our own divine inspiration. The place where we want to do good in the world is reflected in our system. And the places where we're egocentric or narcissistic or distorted or fearful or proud or willful also show up in our politics. And that's essentially what this lecture is about, is what is the, what is the nature of these systems? What was the sort of divine origin, if you don't like divine, but what was, the, what was the good intention in the creation of these systems? Where did they get distorted? How do they live in us personally in truth and distortion? And what do we do about it? 
that's the essence of this lecture. Okay, so the goal for today is to go through what those lectures, what those, what those systems are, to understand them a little better, and then to bring it home to us and say, do you recognize this in yourself? And if you were to change that in yourself, how might that change the system outside of us? Right, because we can do a lot more than just vote. Right, we can participate in a different way as citizens, and I think that's the that's the inspiration of the lecture, more than just a kind of elucidation of, of a system. Okay, so in terms of what's happening now, right, I think we're in a fairly, but probably not, new time of turbulence, where there's a lot of uncertainty, and that uncertainty is driven in part by technology, where technology is replacing human capital. The demographics are changing. So there are people who used to be the majority who are losing that sense of majority and there's a certain loss of identity, certain loss of like, okay, well, now I'm not the majority and also my skill set isn't warranted in this economy, right? There's climate change and climate change is changing the economies of different locations, right? You can't grow crops in certain places, you could before. So things are, things are changing in the environment. There's also, Gender roles are changing. The definition of marriage is changing. We're growing in a more secular way. There's, there's so much happening in the system. And what tends to happen when there's change? Upheaval. Sorry? Upheaval. upheaval. Yeah, and, and, and what, what do you imagine is the primary emotion that comes from an upheaval? Fear. fear. Right, so I tend to think our system is currently motivated by fear. I think at the origin of many of these political systems, they were motivated by wanting to make the system better. I think it came from a desire to, to mature and expand. I think right now we're not in a place like that. I think we're in reaction and I think we're in fear. And when we're in reaction and fear, do you imagine we create in the higher self realm or do you imagine we create in the mask or lower self realm? Yeah, right, so, and we're all, I don't want to say we're all guilty of it, but we're all participating it in some way, right? If you're, if you're, if you in any way are demonizing an opposing view, you are participating in the fear and reaction. And this, I know, <laughs> it's not to shame or blame anyone. It's to say like part of the part of the pathwork is like you got to take ownership of your role as a citizen, and that includes am I demonizing the other, right? Am I participating in fear and reaction? We've got fear and reaction, right? And we wanna move to a place in our system where you know, we are perhaps grounded, right? And creating. And these, these aren't necessarily the opposites of this, but in some way they are, right? Because fear ungrounds us. And when we're ungrounded, we tend to react. Right? When we're grounded, we feel connected, we feel present, right? and then we, in that place we can create. So in some ways, our, the, the next evolution of our political system, what the, what the guide calls the new age politic, is grounded in the idea that it's grounded, it's, it's sort of based on the realities of what's around us, and that it's about creation and expansion and maturation rather than reaction and fear. So this is like the end goal of the new politic in this lecture, which they call the new politics, and we'll talk about what that is. Okay, so the lecture starts with the concept of monarchy, which is uh, one of the earliest political systems. Monarchy is defined by self-rule. So a monarch, unlike the royal family, but a monarch is sort of one leader who is in charge who is in charge. And everyone rule, everyone sort of follows either the king, usually a king, or the queen, the monarch, right? And inherent in the monarch is the idea that that leader is d driven by divine inspiration. That they have the ability to choose the collective good over their self-interest. That they have discipline to be able to rule over others. Right, that they are channeled by something greater than themselves. Right? And because they do that, they're able to enjoy the privileges that a monarch would get. Right? So it's like you pay, you get. You you put in the investment to rule, to be disciplined, to have, you know, divine inspiration to lead, you get the benefits of it. 
That's the, that's the guide sort of version of a monarch in its true form, right? And it was born at a time when people couldn't self-govern. Like we, we, were, and we were in our negativity. We were in a more of an animalistic, I mean, this is a very long time ago, right? We were not, we didn't have in our capacity the ability to self-govern, so someone had to step in and govern us. And that was the monarch. So in its true form, it's meant to sort of rally the troops. It's meant to sort of demonstrate self-rule through discipline, through kind of the sacrifice of your own self-needs for the sake of the collective. That's the divine inspiration. How do you think the monarch gets abused or distorted? I would think the person, the king would think that they were the inspiration. They weren't getting anything from the right. higher power. Right. So they become sort of a, a tyrant, right? Or authoritarian, God. right? God. God. Bow to the king, right? So yes, there can be abuse of the power of the power authority by saying it is I that is God, right? I am not divine inspiration. I am the divine, yes. right? Right. <laughs> and the divine just left the building. <laughs> How else can the monarch be in distortion? Well, if self-rule is about, if, 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 the, if a leader, I mean, we had one, so ideally the leader is, is channeling the divine, right? And, and by divine, I don't necessarily mean God, I just mean sort of the higher self, right? To rule over those who cannot rule for themselves, right? So to abuse that, right, you could take from people, right? You could keep them as un, uncontained people so that you constantly have to be in power. Right? You can become, what happens, sort of an authoritarian. Right? This idea of the absolute monarchy, which is what led to the creation, in part, of things like socialism and communism. Right? It was an imbalance of power by this individual. Right? So the distortion of the monarchy comes from an abuse of power, which is either self-interest over all else, cheating, stealing, absorbing all the power, observing all the riches, and sort of not taking care of the people, right? But the essence of the monarchy is self-rule and self-leadership. So the question is, how does the monarch live in you? What is your relationship to self-rule, self-governance, discipline? Do you channel sort of with your leadership kind of the divine, or are you channeling your ego's needs? You know, are you an inner tyrant towards yourself? Or are you completely permissive and you, and you don't have any discipline and self-rule? So this is the monarchy in its sort of individualized form. And in the lecture it talks about how the follower is as important as the leader. And it's, the leader can be in distortion, but so can the follower. Right? So there's a role for followers in this world. We don't always have to be a leader. But a follower is a ruler in training or a ruler in waiting, right? And a follower has as much responsibility as the leader does to be a responsible citizen. So you can easily be in distortion as a follower as you can as a monarch, right? So for someone who says, I don't participate in the political process, I, I just follow along with sort of what the tribe says or I just follow along sort of with what the, where the tide's turning, there's a way in which the follower is not taking their responsibility as a future leader. So think about it, where am I sort of a monarch in distortion and where am I a follower in distortion? When the lecture talks about the monarch, it says that the monarch is the leader who is willing to give up its sort of, its, gra its own gratifications for the sake of being in leadership. Yeah, and if there's a up in that, I mean, right, the main part of the leadership is to sort of look and see how things run and good, bad, and ugly, and, and if you want to, to affect change in that space. Like it doesn't, there's no, there's not a way to be passive in our politics. Like yeah. we, and then wonder why things are what they are. Uh -huh. You know, so there's a, there is a requirement for us, and this is sort of the story of the monarch, to sort of tap into our innate leadership. Whatever the leadership is, the guide says whether you're a teacher or a janitor or president of a country, it's, it's the same task. Are you in your leadership in that role? 
Because if you are, if you're in self-rule and self-governance and self-discipline and willing to put sort of the collective over your own self-interest, not all the time, but, but to, then you can affect change. And then that change affects change. And that change affects change. Mm -hmm. And then it's affecting a system. You know? It's really pulling, uh, the lecture is really about pulling ourselves into our personal leadership. Because that's the monarch mm -hmm. through self-rule and self-discipline. Yeah, I can see that internally. Uh -huh. I can see that in, in my life. But I don't, I don't make the connection between that and, not that I don't vote and do everything that you do as a citizen, of mm -hmm. course I do. But I still don't feel a direct connection with my inner way of living my life and being responsible and disciplined. And, and politics. politics. Yeah, and it might be. Right, so what I hear you saying, and what you said in the first time, is there may be a narrative you have about <coughs> what politics means. What is it for you? You know, what, 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 is the, what is it that seems so either unappealing or unattainable or so far away or so, oof, that makes you stay out of it? And that's, that's something we're going to explore about what you can do, is to really say, what is my narrative about government? Mm -hmm. Right? Is, is my narrative about government like it's daddy who's going to take care of me? Is my narrative the authoritarian daddy and I'm going to rebel against him? You know, am I going to stay a kid and stay dependent on the system? Am I going to be, exaggerate my independence and sort of say there should be no welfare state, there should be no safety net? You know, how is our own personal story sort of reflected in our idea of what government is, should be, shouldn't be? Right? Because that, so something's coming up in what you're saying around kind of what you view politics to be your government. And that might be your task is to explore what, what are my beliefs around it. So the abuse of the monarch sort of in this kind of authoritarian ruler led to sort of a new system which was more about fairness. It's about creating a more balance where authority was here and the people were here, right? And that created an energetic among other things, imbalance. So how do you create more of a balance? You give more power to the people, right? And so the idea of sort of, of socialist and communist movements, although they're two distinct movements, is to create a system of equity and fairness, right? So the underlying idea of, of from a, its origin for socialism and to some extent communism is this idea of fairness and equity, right? So where the the tyrant of the, of the monarch was about sort of that, the have of one person and the not, have nots of the rest. Socialism and communism was about let's have everyone have the same thing, right? In this idea of equity, equality, and fairness, and justice, which are really great principles, right? Socialism was really about a robust welfare state. It was really about making sure that people were taken care of. Also a good idea right, a sort of divine or sort of higher self quality. How do you think that system can get distorted? I guess if people don't do their, their part. Their part, right. Everybody's supposed to work so that everybody has. Right. Because some people don't do anything and some people will do more and then they'll be resentful of the ones who right. are doing it. So people will take from the system but they won't put into the system. Right, right. okay, that's one. So the guide makes a really important point, and that's I think one of the most salient points of the lecture, which is fundamentally we are all equal, period, end of subject. However, <laughs> we all are, live on different planes of consciousness. There are people that are more evolved than us, right? I may be more evolved than you, you may be more evolved than me in certain aspects. And to not recognize that difference and to not allow the unfoldment of her development for the sake of equity is what the guide says is, is irresponsible. Right? So we have equity, but what's the downside? What doesn't get, you know, in certain economies, socialist economies, there tends to be economic stagnation. And part of the reason why there's stagnation is because there's not a lot of incentives built in the system for people to innovate. Why should I innovate? I'm gonna get $5 at the end of it. She's gonna get $5 at the end of it. What's the point? I might be sort of, I might, and Bev might have something ingenious to bring to, to, the, to the society. A new medicine, a new idea. Right? But the incentives aren't necessarily there and she's not celebrated for what she has to offer because we're, we're equal. 
right? So that's where the system gets distorted. It's, it's we are fundamentally equal and need to treat each other so, but there are ways in which we are different that we should celebrate and allow, why? I don't, I, I mean, I have an opinion about it, but what does the guide say about why? Well, the guide says because part of, and it, this is gonna take us to the next system, is because we're here to live in our full potential. This is what the guide said, <laughs> right? The idea, right, this is what I believe, mm -hmm. is that sort of we, we have innate qualities that ideally in a free system we're able to express. Self-expression is, is something we enjoy in this country and, and value tremendously. To be who we are, to go for what we want, right? And so if you're in a system where that gets squashed for the sake of some idea of equity, or equality, then that fulfillment of that individual gets lost. So the guide says there's a distortion about equity and equality in a socialized system. Does that make sense to everyone? Because it's a really, really important point, right? Because yes, we need safety, and yes, we need to feel that we are all equal under the law and treated as such. But we also, I believe, need to be given the freedom to express. And express can be in the form of creating something new for the world, or it can be expressing who you are, you know, your gender, your sexuality, your, your, your creativity, whatever it is, to have that freedom to do that and to have it be celebrated in some way, either through economic incentives or through what, however, whatever other mechanism, that that is important. And if you don't do that, you create stagnation. And energetically, what happens when you create stagnation? Right, energy goes down. And they, have, they show that in certain countries where there's economic stagnation, there's decreased quality of life, and there's actually a lower um, life expectancy. Because the energy is stagnant, right? The energy looks like this versus this. Right, feel into sort of what happens to you, whether it's, it's your identity or whether it's your creativity or whether it's your sexuality or whether it's your desire to speak up. What happens when that gets shut down? What impact does that have on us? So that's what the guide says is the distortion of, the, of, of sort of the socialist political theory, communist political theory, is that for the sake of equity and fairness, which again are higher self qualities, there is a, uh, a diminishment of the individual. And that diminishment of the individual has an effect on sort of the, the, the sort of not only the individual, but the society. Because when we are given the freedom to express, we can create in a way that when we aren't, we cannot. Right? So how does the, how, how might that live in us? You know, how might sort of for the sake of, uh, you know, I'm part of an, uh, an organization that is like terrified of making people special. And it's a distortion, right? So, but everyone is sort of kept on the same level and has to go through the exact same process to sort of elevate, right? Because it's fair that way. But what does that do for the people that are sort of traveling that journey who are exceptional, who have something to offer now? Do you think those people will stay in the organization? Why would they? They might. Yeah. Like I mean, they might. For trying to right. Express right. 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 So you can see where it's like this idea of like, you know, we're afraid to make people special. We're afraid to sort of highlight someone's exceptionalism because there's some fear in us, right, that something, you know, some, there's some distortion in the idea that we can't recognize someone's exceptionalism because somehow that that takes away from the other. And maybe that lives in you. You know, is there a way where you don't want to overshadow anybody because there's a fear that if I'm big, you know, if I celebrate my own exceptionalism, I'm going to lose connection with others. Or I'm going to be accused of trying to be something and I'm not being fair to the other. I mean, this, it plays out all, it plays out in a lot of different ways day to day. You know, I won't be big. Why? What's the hit to the team or the hit to you that you'd have to take if you let yourself be exceptional? Not being liked by others. Not being liked by others. 
not being like others. And is that a good thing or a bad thing in the in what you're saying? It's, it's real. There's something to be said about conformity, and there's something to be said about all of us sort of being in line, and then there's something to be said about sort of people who need to rise, rise. To let the unfoldment of their potential happen. And in a system, in the distortion of a socialized system, that can't happen. That's the argument that the, that the, that the guide is making. Right? So what was the response to that is sort of the founding, you know, it happened certainly in other, in your, certain European countries, but in, the, in, in sort of the formation of democracy, right, and what the guy calls a capitalistic democracy where you have a free market and a, a fairly democratic process. It's more of a representational democracy, but like a democracy. And that was in response to this idea of like, the cooperative movement and the collectivism and the equity and the equality of the socialized movement, you, they were seeing the stagnation and created said, we want to be free. We want actually the pursuit of happiness as a quality. I mean, you don't see pursuit of happiness in socialism and communism, and you certainly don't see it in the monarchy. But this was the first time that we were talking about happiness as actually like a virtue to, to work towards. And that was in the creation of, of this country, right? And so this was about free self-expression, the unfoldment of one's individual potential, about you know, a free press, about elections where we had the ability to sort of have our voice and take a stand and create the system of governance. Right? So this, the guide says that capitalistic democracy is the most mature form of government to date. Because if done right, it includes a welfare state. It includes a way in which we recognize that not everyone can take care of themselves and need to be taken care of. But it doesn't do it at the expense of individual expression. That freedom and the pursuit of, of happiness is as important as equity, equality, fairness, justice, and self-rule. So, you know, it very much says it's not the last system, but it is the most mature system we have. So how does our system get abused? When the one percent has everything. When the one percent has everything. So abuse of the so the few basically Survival hold all the power. Yeah. Okay. How else does the system get abused? When we have more freedom, do we tend to um, what do you think the relationship is between freedom and abusing that freedom? Self-interest. So the more freedom you have, the more self-interested you are? Some people. Okay. And then the more likely are you or to or abuse the system? Right, to tear it, to gain it. Okay, I'm to gain it. I'm democracies turn into oligarchies eventually. Without a higher self, yes. Right. And selective privilege. Selective privilege. Like these freedoms were only really granted to people. Right. Yep. Yep. They come with conditions too. Yep. Yep. Anyone else? And also there's, with freedom, there comes that option of not really exercising your responsibility. Yes. So for example, you know, many, many people don't vote. Right. I mean, we have this great... <laughs> opportunity to, and people don't exercise that, that privilege. Yes. And then complain about the system. Exactly. Right? And then yes. say, well, I don't, I don't vote because it's pointless or it doesn't matter or, right. you know, uh, and there's certainly abuses to the electoral system. I mean, there's disadvantaged, people are disadvantaged and, you know, that's, that's a separate issue. But, mm -hmm. but if you can vote and you don't vote, and then sort of, excuse my language, bitch about the system, I'm curious as to what's happening. Mm -hmm. Like what's going on for you? You know, that you're, that you're an observer, you're a critic, but not willing to participate. What's happening? And how does, how is that, how does that live in you? You know, do you sit on the sidelines and point your finger and sort of, you know, critique your, your organizations, your families, your relationships, mm -hmm. but not take responsibility for your part? Right? You know, how do you exploit the system? Right? So there's a, in the, in the lecture, and it's so tricky because in this environment, you know, it's hard to say certain things, right? But the guide says, you know, 
it's not only the people in power who abuse the system, it's the people that depend on the system that can abuse the system, right? And this certainly lives in us. Like, where do we maintain our own victimization, our own dependency? Where do we stay the sort of dependent child in our life? Where do we say, I can't do something because my parents didn't, and I'm a victim of that, and therefore I can't, and so I have to continue to rely on my partner, my, my this. Like, where do we stay the victim, and where do we stay dependent in our, and then where do we abuse our freedom? Like, it, it's both sides, or both, both entities are guilty of distortion in the system. I remember one of the, I used to work in politics, and my first, I, my first boss was a Republican in Massachusetts, and I was a neophyte. I mean, I didn't know much. I was a woman's studies from Barnard, major from Barnard. I had sort of very liberal views, and now I was working for this Republican in Massachusetts. And he basically said to me, um, the Democrats want to keep dependence dependent. And all their policies are about perpetuating dependency. And I remember hearing that being like, yikes, that sounds really extreme. And, and that's, that's a fairly cynical view to think that sort of a party is pushing their political agenda to maintain dependency because if people stay dependent, they stay in power. That was his argument, right? And as I kind of worked throughout politics, I saw a certain truth to that. Like not, not at a macro level, but in it, you could, it, there was, tr there was a truth to it, right? There was an abuse of power by those in power by exploiting those who needed them. There was a perpetuation of their dependency. It was like, oh, I see that you feel victimized. I'm gonna keep that story going so that you need me so that I stay in power. And that, until we allow that in the debate, until we kind of allow, like, these are the kinds of uncomfortable conversations that we need to have in order to really affect change. Otherwise, we do what, hap what happens now is you watch the news, and there's one side saying this, and then the other side says, you're a demon, and the other side says, no, you're the demon, because there's, there's, there is no conversation about what's actually happening here. Right? And so if we as individuals can own, where do I exploit my own victim? Where do I ignore my privilege? Where do I sort of, you know, depend on the system and take from the system but don't give to the system? Like, we need to explore that in ourselves. By system, I mean in your own lives, in your relationships, in your work environments. Like, how is that living in us? That's what the guide keeps inviting us to do. Yes, look at the system, see where they're broken, and the way to fix them is to fix yourself. Because the systems innately are good systems. Think what they were born out of. They're meant to sort of support equity, fairness, self-rule, freedom of expression. They're inherently really good systems. Who, excuse me, fucks it up? People. <laughs> Why? Because people are fucked up. Because we're distorted and, and destructive and we have a lower self and we are self-righteous. I mean, again, we're not horrible, but we're, we're obstructed. And so then our systems will be obstructed and distorted. So what better way to fix the system than to fix ourselves? And that is, I think, sometimes at the true responsible citizen isn't just to be educated about this, the, the issues and isn't just to vote, but to, to change the system within you because then by definition, the system outside of us changes. Do you guys agree at least with that, with that premise? Yeah. Right? So the guide offers this idea of a new politic. And the new politic is essentially the integration of the monarch the socialists and the capitalistic democracy in their true forms. Which to me makes perfect sense in terms of it's possible because the, the, the so if the monarch is about self-rule and socialism is about equity and justice and sort of the welfare state and if democracy and capitalism is about um, self-expression and the unfoldment of our individual and collective creativity, then what an interesting political system. 
It's a system where people are responsible for themselves. It's a system where we appreciate that not everyone can be responsible for themselves in its entirety, and we need a system that supports them, a safety net, a welfare system. It treats everyone as equals in terms of equal under the law, and it has a system of justice and fairness, but not at the expense of the enfoldment of one's self-expression, where all the goodies can happen, where sort of innovation happens and creativity happens. And so, the, so when you hear, one thing I hear a lot in the debate now is the demonization of the socialists, right? Like, oh my God, Bernie Sanders is a socialist, and you know, and I get what they're doing. Remember we talked about fear, right? So in the US, we pride ourselves, going back to this idea of the idealized image, we pride ourselves on being like, it's all about the individual, it's all about freedom. It's all about having the right to sort of give what you want and then take the investment from it. And these socialists are going to come and take my freedom away. Right? So first of all, we are, as, we are already a socialist country in the sense of we have a welfare state. We, I think we agree that we have a social responsibility to take care of one another. We, are, we, we try to create equity and justice. We have a legal system. You know, we believe people are equal under the law. It's in distortion, it's broken, right? But we already embody socialism in this nation. But in our mask and lower self, we demonize socialism, right? Because it's gonna, it's gonna play to your fear that you're not gonna have your right to, you know, do what you wanna do. So you better not, better not go this way, right? So here's where the demonization and our attachment to our idealized idea of what this country is. The f I think the flag, not the flag, well the flag, yes, but the, the whole uh, national anthem drama is another good example, right? Where we hold on to this idea that that national anthem is so sacred and if someone kneels during that song that that's a sign of, of disrespect, right? Because we're so wed to the idea of that song Right? And it's possible that those people who are very attached to that song, I'd be curious to know what they do with the rest of their lives in terms of are they living that, the, all the virtues and values of sort of what America represents. And not to say they don't. I'm simply saying that we get so attached to this like, these symbols, and it's important to honor the, our attachment to symbols. Because what the other side tends to do also is demonize the attachment to symbols and values. Right? So, I mean, I'm getting into issues here that are controversial, but I'm trying to approach them not in terms of the content, but in terms of what's happening for people. So I hope you can hear it that way. That's a separate issue. But it's like someone's attachment to a, a value or a virtue that, that is important to them. It's important to honor that. And there's a fear of that loss. The world's changing, and there's, it's, it's like, well, what happened to apple pie and, and the flag? And, you know, there's, and, and it's not, again, it's, it's, it's about just appreciating that those things mean something to somebody. And so when they feel it being taken away, like anybody else, you react. And you want someone to say, I get this is important to you. It's changing, but I hear you. Right? So we have to be willing to understand on some level, short of someone who wants to literally prohibit someone from having equal rights. I, I, I don't really have much to say to that person, although they need to be heard, I suppose, on some level. But people who, you know, people who are willing to have a civil dialogue and debate, there has to be a way in which we're willing to listen. There has to be a way that we may be willing to see the goodness in someone else. So cynicism is the, you know, when I said I'm cynical, like there's a way where you just assume the other person has no good intentions. So if someone believes, if someone's a Republican and they believe in limited government, bad, they don't care about anybody, right? If someone's a liberal and they believe in big government, then they don't want to teach a man to fish, they just want to keep fishing for them so that they never have to, I mean, there's these absolute sort of feet in the ground that says this is who you are, you can't move from that place. Societies that, that do not see each side as having them any merit or goodness in them can never evolve. So another thing that we can do differently is how many of you watch like a news program? Like you, you choose, you watch whether it's CNN or Fox or no? 13. 13? 
PBS. And when you watch a debate or you watch a dialogue, do you tend to go towards that side that you agree with most? Right. And what happens to the other person? Do you see them? Do you hear them? Do you make assumptions about them? Uh huh. See them as less than. Less than. Yes. Sure. Right. You can say stupid, you know, I mean, really, you know, ignorant, uneducated. Okay. Right. How, how, how helpful is that? <laughs> uh, of course, it's nothing. Shut uh -huh. the door. I mean, you want to take them and ship them out of the country. Right. It's ridiculous. Right. So, what is your, what is, what is, what is our task in terms of a willingness? Well, first of all, the task is the willingness to listen. The task is the willingness to sort of address our cynicism. You know? If, if we don't assume on some level that someone has innate goodness, even if they're misguided about an idea, right? Or even if we disagree with them on an idea, how can we meet them? How can we compromise if we demonize them? Right. So, so, you know, I write these things down, like, how do I demonize? How do I not sort of trust in the goodness of another viewpoint? You know, where am I self-righteous? Where is it more important for me to be right than to be humble about the idea that maybe the way to solve a problem is, like you said, a version of two distinct ideas? You know, where am I in my pride or my self-will? Where is there a demand that it has to be my way? And if it's not my way, then you're just an ignorant, uneducated person. Right? Where am I stuck in my idealized idea of, like, socialism or my idealized idea of democracy? And I can't see where the system's broken. Right? Where am I not participating? And if you take all of those and sort of say, how is, how, what's my relationship to that in the world? I think you'll see the answer is, what's my relationship to that with myself? Right? Do I live in my idealized image of myself? Right? Do I go after, do I demonize myself? Am I a tyrant? Do I abuse the system? Do I exploit my victimization? Do I not recognize my privilege? Do I live in a place of right or wrong all the time? How stagnant am I in my life because I am not self-expressing or I'm not allowing the unfoldment of who I am? And that's, that's the lecture. Like, that's it. That's, this is a very actually simple, I mean, I'm sure I'll read it again and be like, wow, this is complicated. But <laughs> it's, it's, it's a simple lecture that says our systems are a reflection of who we are. They reflect our own contradictions of character. They reflect our own impulses. They reflect our struggles. They reflect our higher self. And that in order to change the systems outside of us, we have to change ourselves. And in order to do that, there are things that we need to be willing to do, not only look at our own kind of behavior, look at how we relate to self-rule, equity, self-expression, but also how we act in the world. Because what's happening now is there's a lot of acting out in the world of the lower self. The screaming at each other, the, the lack of civility, the self-righteousness, the pointing the fingers, the blaming, the shaming, the, the demonization, the, the, you know, the tribalism. All of that is us acting out our fear about, I don't know, change? Identity, a sense of belonging, like, you know. Yes? Doesn't, in one of the lectures, or maybe a lot of them, doesn't the guy talk about any negative trend has its basis in something positive? I'm sorry? It's a distortion. So a positive trend distorted seems negative, but it's, but when you get to the core of it, it's actually <coughs> positive. So, like, Fearful is the positive is being um, discerning. Yeah, sure. I mean, and I, but imagine moving from fear into discernment, because we're not discerning. What fear brings us into judgment. 
and criticism, right? But, but if, we're, if we ground ourselves with the fear and say like, I'm afraid, what am I afraid of? I'm afraid I don't belong in this society anymore because the, the economy is changing and I don't know my role and they're getting rid of coal and technology is coming in and I don't know who I am. I'm not educated to be able to do this or that, right? I don't know what, what can I do differently. That's discernment, right? But in a fearful place where we think things are being taken from us, what do we do instead? We blame an immigrant, right? We blame someone else, we scapegoat someone else for what's happening. That's not discernment. There may be a truth to the fact that like people are taking lower wage jobs and it's pushing people out of the market. Sure, that's discernment. But the acting out, the sort of viciousness, the, the, the scapegoating, the, that, that's fear in reaction. And we're trying to move from a place of groundedness so that we can create. So that we can say, okay, everything's changing. And people are coming to the country and technology's coming in and jobs are going out. Like we have to do something. Can we evolve into the next evolution of our politic? And that's this new age politic. But we can't do it from here. And we are in here. We, we, I, I, I'm yet to see a lot of things that isn't, even if you watch some of the marches, there's a lot of negativity in those marches. There's a lot of demonizing in those marches. That's not to say people don't have a right to their anger, but it's, it's, a lot of it's living here. Right, so I think that's a really great point. Like how do you take that fear and, and sort of use it to be discerning of what to do rather than reacting? Well, I mean, the guide says that, sep that this, the idea of separateness is, a, is, a act, is evil. It actually defines separateness as evil, right? Because there's a distortion in the idea that it's either me or you. That, that you and I are fighting for the same pie, piece of pie. And so we have to compete, right? Versus we have to collaborate and figure out a way to make it work, right? And there's nothing wrong with competition. But, but the idea is this, I, this notion that sort of it's every man for himself, even though in reality that is how it plays out, that that distortion is what creates all this nonsense, right? Because there are the, com the, the common, the, you know, both sides want to belong, right? I heard, I heard one of the candidates speak that, you know, the, 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 the coal miner in, in West Virginia needs to belong just as much as sort of the kid, the transgender child who needs to go to the bathroom. They both are looking to fit in. They both want to know that they're safe, that they can, you know, sort of survive in this world, thrive in this world. Right? So we all share that need to belong and sort of feel safe in our identity. Right? It's the how that starts to create, that's more driven by, well, the how is also, I think, still our higher self, but we quickly move into lower self energy when the ego comes in and the self-righteousness comes in. It's, like, it, it's, it's at that level where I think it gets distorted. The needs, I think, are universal to some extent. The, the desire to affect change, I think, is, is there. There's goodness in, all, in most of us to, to try and affect change. The how may be different, but there's something in the how being different that creates all sorts of problems, right? And so going back to this idea of like, what can you do? Like, where do you have to be right? Notice in your life where you have to be right and why. Why is it so important for you to be right? Because that's what's happening in the, in the debates. I'm right, you're wrong. That's it, okay. Well, I can't get into the head of someone who denies climate change, but my, my curiosity from a psychological standpoint would be, what would you have to experience if you acknowledge that it was changing? Like, what would you have to give up? Right, because so much what's tied to climate change is regulatory change, which is going to have a direct impact on industries that people may benefit from. So that's a cynical statement saying they don't really believe it's not changing. They just know that if it does, they admit that the climate's changing, that they're going to have to make changes that then affect their back, their back pocket. I mean, that's a cynical view, but that's what I would want to get curious about. And I would say the same thing to someone on the other side, because there's also a whole economy waiting to address climate change, whether it's solar panels or wind. I mean, there's also as many financial incentives on the other side, right? So I'm now being cynical when I talk that I wouldn't be. 
but you know it's like we have to get that the, the point is is that our egos our little egos greed sort of it's going to bleed into the system where we otherwise may have a higher self understanding of something right so for example if you took all the if you took all the money out of this conversation and just had a, a, a conversation about climate change where nothing would be affected, nothing, no, no industry would be affected and no one would lose money and everyone would gain money, it's possible that we'd all agree that there's climate change. Sure. But I don't know, so that's what I'm saying. That's, but, we have to get, but we have to get curious and, and before we make that assumption, ask the question. Like what would you have to feel if you accepted that the climate is changing? people that may not, may not know science at all. They have to trust these people are, that they, they know the world better than this other person who doesn't Right, trust. and I think what I want to say to you in that, it's, it's possible, but when we generalize, when we say things like these people, right? I don't, who, who are you talking right? And it, this, is where the, this is where the dialogue happens, right? Is to ask that person, what is it about? Do you ha is there something you have about science, right? Or wh what, what is it about climate change that feels like you can't own that it's happening, right? So, so you think that I'm when I say that, that I'm coming from some just idea in my head that these people, by the way, they're my family, so uh -huh. I know them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, that I'm coming from some abstract place. No, I just think, I just think, if you're having, if you're having a, a conversation with someone, right? And you, wanna, you want that conversation to evolve into some opportunity for change. How you have that conversation, the tone, the, the language, the, the generalizations or the, the appreciation for the other person on some level will, will, will determine to some extent whether that happens or not. So, you know, the, the never Trumpers or the MAGA people, you know, it's like when we, do, when we do that, when we loop all of those people in together, we do ourselves a disservice. One, it creates more separation and separation is evil. That's what the guide says, right? So the less connection, in connection we are, the less likely we are to evolve into a new politic. So we have to be willing on some level, right, to, there's this great line in, um, well, Hannah knows I'm like obsessed with Chuck Jefferson and Adams. Um, there's this, there, there's a great line in one of the, um, in the John Adams film where John, uh, Jefferson says to Adams, like, you have my friendship, you don't have my support. And it's this great line. It's a great line. It says, like, I love you. I cannot support you in this. Right? I don't agree with you in this. But I'm not going to leave you by demonizing you or looping you into these people. Right? So I think that there's a, you know, if you're, if you're watching one news program, and that program is always going to say what it is you want to hear, then that's where you're getting information. How educated are you? How willing are you to hear someone else's point of view and perspective? And if you're unwilling and you're only willing to stay in what you know and what you believe in, what impact does that have? And this stuff is happening every day in our lives. It's not all on a political level, right? And all politics is local, right? That, that's the idea. It's all, it's all, it's all it starts, it's end of one. It starts here anyway. So the guide says there's, there's three sort of, no, I mean, there's more, but the three evils in this world are this idea of that we're separate, materialism, our reliance on sort of our, our, you know, we think this is all there is, and so we have to hoard as much stuff as we can get. And the third is half-truths and lies. And I think that the seduction of sound bites and things like using the word heroes Right? All of that stuff is meant to elicit something. It's meant to manipulate us. You said politics. I worked in politics. It is a game. It is seduction. It is seduction and it is manipulation and is, it is playing. You know, we had a white, when I was a lobbyist, we had a whiteboard and we would message the shit out of stuff because we knew that if we said it just the right way to the right audience, they would hear it a certain way and then give us what, you know.
there's a great movie called Brexit where it goes through what what it, but what each side did to sort of bring the vote forward. And there's this amazing scene where there's this huge whiteboard. Each side has a whiteboard, and they go from fear to xenophobia. They they pull everything they can to create their messaging to get each side to to stay with them. And we are responsible. We are the consumers of that information. So we have to. One of the tasks we can also do is where am I getting seduced by the system? Where am I getting manipulated by half truths? Right? It's sometimes I'll watch it with that eye, and I'll see. I'll read. I'll read an interview, and then I'll watch what the news reports on that interview. And if that interview is all I saw, I would say, "Wow, this is a really bad guy." And then I read the whole interview, and I'm like, oh, wait, that's not what happened, right? That, that selective reporting is meant to put you back in your fear so that you do react, and react is usually whatever they want you to do, right? So we, are as, we need to be responsible for how we are educated and how we are not being educated. Because if you are seduced by words like heroes or manipulated by half-truths, you know, you're perpetuating that. And then if you go out and repeat that story, then you're an active participant in it. And what's scary is it's hard to know where to get the right news. I mean, it's actually quite difficult to know, like, you know, I literally can go from channel to channel and l hear one side of the story and then hear the exact opposite from the other viewpoint. And I'm like, you know, I have to discern. I have to use discernment to figure out what the hell is actually going on here. But I have to be the monarch in my life and go do that for myself. I have to be disciplined enough to go and find that information, have the conversation, ask the questions of the family and saying, where does that come from? What, where does that belief stem from? What's your attachment to that? Why do you believe that? What is your fear about big government? What's your fear of limited government? What is government to you? What role is government supposed to play? Like, if we can get into the psychology of what people are feeling, then we can understand what's actually sort of coming out of their mouth. Like the guide says, is you're, the monarch in you doesn't have to be in the role you play in a larger system. It could be the role you play in your, in your own world. Because the idea is if you're, if you're in truth in that world, that's going to affect the larger world around you. So doing your part is doing your part in your individual life. doesn't mean you have to be part of politics. It might be. But in some way, you are part of the political system if you're doing sort of your part in your role, in your life, whatever that, whatever that looks like. You know, Because the idea is that it gets paid forward. It, it, it has a ripple effect. <laughs> Whoa, that's all it took. It is over, but here's the thing: it it is overwhelming because it's like we're talking about it, it, these systems can feel abstract, and we can feel our power. When we were sitting in a room in New York City, we're we we're not we're not the change makers in terms of the people who are affecting change, but we can be. And I think if if we don't see our our need for leadership, whatever leadership looks like, then we're not participating in the larger system. And it doesn't mean you have to run for office. It's not about necessarily participating in that system. It's about influencing what that system looks like by affecting the change in what's around you, starting with yourself. And I mean, I have a degree in public health. and. In studying sort of healthcare policy, we talk about social determinants of health, whether it's smoking, diet, exercise, green grocers, um, safe environments, right? We each have a responsibility if we're going to, if we're going to utilize the system to fight for access to those things and then to actually do those things, right? So if I come to you and say, I, you know, I want to lose 20 pounds, and then you said, well, what do you eat today? And I said, well, I had 52 donuts. <laughs> you know? You might be like, you yeah, like yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but maybe you'd say, right and, and then I said, and I'm not losing, I don't understand. I don't want to hear it. Right? 
right? And then my, sh my sugar goes high and I'm, you know, my insulin's off and then I'm in that, right? And it's not, about, it's not about shaming or blaming anyone. It's just about saying that like, you know, there are determinants that affect our, us and the communities around us. And so we get to, we, there's certain decisions we have to make. And if we're in environments where those decisions aren't, well, then we have to fight for them. Right, because there are communities up in up in, in New York City that don't have green grocers, and then we expect them to eat well. It's like, well, how are you going to explain them to eat well if no, if Whole Foods won't go there, or if, right? So, part of the advocacy is us to create an ability for people to determine their well-being in a better way, in a more effective way, and that's where the socialist theory comes in. You know, creating equity and justice is to create policies and systems that allow people to self-express. Because if a kid up in Harlem doesn't have access to green grocers and can't exercise and then becomes stagnant emotionally, mentally, physically, he can't unfold who he really is. Because we don't have a system where we're taking care of other people. Right? So it's like you can see where this could be if we could do it. Such an effective system where we help each other, you know? We, we do teach them to fish so they can fish for themselves, but we gotta give them a pond to fish in first, <laughs> right? So, and you know, I hope you don't hear anything in this discussion that self-interest is bad, right? We don't wanna demonize that either, you know? It's, it's, it's like, but, there, but imbalances in any system creates a problem. So if self-interest outweighs everything, then you have abuses to the system. To find that balance between self-interest and the interest of the greater good, ideally they're, they're not so far apart from each other, right? But, but it takes a certain amount of ego strength and a lot less fear to be able to say, I'm willing to maybe decrease my self-interest for the sake of the collective because I know in the end that's in my self-interest, right? But in our fearful place where we're all survivalists and it's eat or be eaten, it's really hard to say, oh well, yeah, I'll give up my self-interest for the collective. That's not how Darwinism worked, right? <laughs> I mean, it's survival of the fittest, so I better be the fittest, whatever that looks like. More money, more of this, more, more power, more, right? So these distortions of kind of the, the essence, the beauty of these creations is where we need to sort of what is our entry point. I wrote some things of what you can do. Center of glasses. Oh, my God. No. <laughs> <laughs> I need a 1.0 prescription. <laughs> Anyone? No? Okay. All right. Okay, what we can do as a next step. Look at your own I wrote citizenry, but look at your own uh, citizenry from this new perspective, which is how, how do these systems live in me? Oh no, thank you, thank you though. How do these systems live in me? In truth and in distortion. Where are the distortions in the system a reflection of a distortion in me? So if I, if I, if I um, conform, because it's easier to conform than it is to be my individualized self, then I'm sort of living out the distortion of that socialist theory. So where do I conform in my life because it's easier? Where I don't want to be seen in the light because that comes with too much responsibility, right? Where am I denying my own enfoldment and saying, oh, well, it's just to belong. It's just because I, you know, I want to... Right? So look at where kind of the distortions in the system are reflections of your own distortions. In your self-righteousness, how many people here think they are self-righteous in their politics? Sometimes. Sometimes. Anyone else? There you go. Anyone? Anyone? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> what? Yes, you are? Yes, we have a, yes, can be. If you are, not saying you are, if you are, I want you to ask yourself, what is your demand? So we know what your judgment is. Your judgment is, I'm right, you're wrong. I'm good, you're bad. I care about people, you don't care about people. I want to save the planet, you don't. Uh, you know, whatever. I mean, just watch the news, you'll figure it out, right? So in that, in that I'm right, you're wrong, there's a demand underneath it. What is the demand? 
okay? So that may be the need, but there's a demand in, I'm right, you're wrong. You should stop being stupid and do what you want. That's the judgment. But say that again? They should stop being stupid. And the do stop being stupid is the judgment. Okay. And then you said something else. And do what you want them to do. Do what you want them to do. Right. So the demand is do it my way. Right. Right? What if you're raised better? That's discernment. What if it is? Right? It might be. Your way might be better. Right? But there's a big difference between my way might be better, are you willing to look at it, versus you better do it my way. And if you don't do it my way, I'm going to demonize you by calling you this, that, and the other thing. 